Okay, welcome to the presentation on diffraction. So the aim of this presentation is to use Huygens' principle to explain diffraction. Okay, so we looked at the ripple tank. This is a still taken from the ripple tank, which has been um, touched up to make it clearer what was happening. Um, and we saw, although this picture isn't, isn't uh, where you have optimum diffraction happening, it's close to it. When the gap size is close to the wavelength size, you get the most amount of diffraction. Uh, and what we saw was you got a wave coming in, and the wave itself would spread out, um, and you'd get these funny kind of interference patterns here where the wave was cancelling out or the intensity of the wave was less. If you were to draw a graph of this, of the intensity of the wave, you get a minimum point, a maximum point, and a maximum point uh, on, on the graph, and, uh, and you get a pattern like shown here. So we need to use Huygens' principle to explain this. Why does this happen? Okay, so Huygens' principle states that a wave front, and remember a wave front is any point on a wave which is the same, like this line here or this line here, and, and the same in these, in these circular lines as well are wave fronts. Um, you can consider it as a secondary source of spherical wavelets. So for instance, take it for example this line here. We could think of this as a load of spherical wavelets spreading out. Uh, in the forward direction at the speed of light. Now it says the speed of light, so that's what applies to light, but if you're talking about in a ripple tank, it's the speed at which the waves would move in the ripple tank. Uh, the new wave front is tangen uh, tangential to the surface of all the secondary wavelets. Okay, so let's try and understand this with an example. So firstly, what is a wavelet? Okay, so a wavelet is like a... Um, uh, like if you were to drop a stone into water, you'd see a ripple spread out. Well, you could think of that as a wavelet. Okay, so here's a wavelet, and I'm going to, for the sake of uh, simplicity, we're just going to say that the black lines will represent uh, positive displacements. But if you remember from the definition of a wavefront, it's just an identical point on the wave at any point. Uh, so this could be the peak, and you could go along this line and find that the peak of the wave was always here. It may not be the peak, though. But just to make this, this presentation simpler to understand and easier to understand, I'm going to stick with... Uh, the black line is going to represent a positive displacement, and uh, if you imagine then, if you were to go backwards, you'd eventually come to the point where you've got the trough of that displacement, or the negative displacement. So if you were to match it up with this picture here, the black line would be this positive displacement where the water is higher, and the blue line is representing where the water is lower, the trough. Okay, so that is a wavelet. How can we make a straight line out of a wavelet? If we put many wavelets together, you start to see that these positive displacements will be adding up with the other positive displacements uh, all here. okay? And the positive displacements will be cancelling out with the troughs or the negative displacements of the other wavelets here. Or you could think of it as the troughs will be all adding up here. So the more you get, the more you can basically replace this complicated picture with a simple picture of here is the positive displacement of the wave or the um, the peak, and here's the trough of the wave. So that's it simplified. So let's look at modeling a plane wave. So this would be like the um, the ripples in the ripple tank moving forward from the uh, beam that's bouncing up and down. Now let's replace the line by many, many wavelets. Okay, so I'm just showing one line for each wavelet. You can imagine that if this was the positive part, then the negative part of the displacement would be somewhere about here as well. Okay, um, and you can see that pretty much they would form a new line. And you could do an infinite number of wavelets. You could do a thousand little dots and uh, across here, and they clearly would make up a flat line then, a straight line. Okay, and then the wavelets would grow. You know, you could drop a pebble into uh, water and you'd watch a, a wavelet grow and, uh, and grow and grow. And you basically have achieved the same thing as just drawing a straight line each uh, wavelet. Okay, so let's have a look at actually how this explains diffraction. So we saw it in the ripple tank. The ripples come towards a barrier, and uh, there's a hole in the barrier, and around the edges of that hole, you get diffraction. It's actually, you can see that this wave would be spreading out. Now remember, we could model this with many more points, and you'd get a clearer, more accurate picture of what really happens. Okay, and as these wavelets grow, you get some interesting things happening. 
I think it's pretty clear to see that here you're going to have very strongly reinforcing um, and a high amplitude of wave and the same here here and maybe around here it's going to be a little bit messed up not quite reinforcing in other areas you can see that this black line the purple line or the red line at some point is going to be falling so this let's just imagine it was positive displacement it would be falling into the negative displacement of the black uh, wavelet so these two would really be cancelling each other out similarly you could say that the green line is falling into um, maybe the purple lines well a little bit anyway you're going to get negative displacement uh, sorry you're going to get um, it's going to be cancelling itself out here and it's going to be adding up here here and here so you're going to get a similar kind of pattern so you can see already Huggins principle does quite a good job of uh, explaining some of this it also helps us understand why if the gap size is identical to the wavelength you get maximum diffraction so if we model it here okay and the reason I've just done these as different colors is just to make it easier to interpret the pictures it's not intrinsic to the principle okay so on the first step you can see um, you're getting maximum displacement here and you can see that the green line is going to add up with the red line on both sides so that's also going to be positive displacement let's just keep the, the model going okay and if we analyze here you can see clearly that the orange the green and the red are all going to add up so a bigger wave okay so this line is just what you'd have in this plane okay so you get maximum uh, amplitude here let's choose another point on the side and take that line and put it across here and then analyze the waves what's going to happen to them okay now it's a bit hard to see what's going on here but you could for instance take the green and the um, the yellow line add them up and you can see that because they're together like this that the purple line replaces the green and the yellow line okay and now these are going to cancel each other out but because the purple line is slightly bigger than the red line you're still going to have some um, some displacement okay and then let's take uh, this part okay so you can see clearly that the, the red and the yellow are going to cancel each other out exactly and you'd just be left with the amplitude of the green line so you, you're going to still get some variation in the amplitude as you go around but you're going to get um, the most diffraction happening when the wave size is the same size as the gap that it's moving through okay so let's just look at this with uh, uh, when you make the wavelength smaller than the gap size okay and you get uh, less diffraction you get a lot of reinforcement here and you start to see you're going to be getting cancelling out here as the lines aren't uh, on top of each, uh, on top of each other okay let's just make it a bit closer okay and again this is when you get the uh, wavelength is getting closer towards the gap size and you are starting to get constructive interference here and uh, obviously it's all constructive here and there will be some cancelling out around uh, these kind of areas you can see that the, the the orange line here is falling into the gap of the uh, the green line so this would be in the negative displacement of the um, the green lines uh, uh, wave and uh, it would be cancelling it out at that point there so you'd be getting interference okay so this is true in water waves and this is a great way of looking at light okay so what I'm actually going to do now is make a, uh, a really small hole in a piece of tin foil uh, so that we can see some diffraction effects happening if you take a pin and you actually puncture the tin foil and I don't know if you can actually see this possibly you can that hole will be way too big but if I take the pin and I put it on something hard, like a ceramic plate, and I just push it into the plate, maybe give it a little twist. I'm just going to do that one more time. And I slightly tore the tin foil. And the hole will be so small, you'll lose it unless you draw around it. I've now produced a hole small enough to show the effects of diffraction. Okay, so I'm just going to attempt to show you just how small the dot is you need to make. Here's the dot I made by puncturing 
the uh, that's this one here. Uh, I just punctured it with a needle, and the dot here, the camera just gets focused. You can just about see there's a tiny dot in the centre of that circle. What I'm going to do is use my presenting uh, wand or whatever for, for when I'm doing PowerPoint in class, and fire a laser at the tiny little hole, and we'll see what comes through on the other side on on a screen. Is light a wave? What I've shown already um, is to do an experiment uh, using a pinhole and, um, a, and a red laser light and, um, and uh, then take some very, very slow photography of it to try and get the resolution of the picture out. And this is what I got. Okay? After many, many attempts, it wasn't easy actually to get this picture because you have to set up the camera per uh, perfectly in order to do it. But anyway, you've got something going on here. Now, because my picture isn't great, you can definitely see, if this was just one hole, how come there's this ring around the outside of it? How come there isn't just uh, one splodge in the middle? And the reason is, it's because light is being diffracted, because light is a wave, or has wave-like behavior anyway. This is a, uh, a photo taken from Hyperphysics, and they've obviously spent a lot of time and effort doing this, and I read on the site that they made um, many pinholes, and they, 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 went, they worked out worked through them and, and they found the best one and you can clearly see many uh, areas where you're getting constructive interference and then the, the bright central spot. If you look at just the center of that picture you're basically getting a diffraction pattern and, and it's the same thing. Okay, So we can extend this idea further um, and it turns out you can really express this in a very simple way. If you imagine a wave coming in this direction and you've got a gap here you can make some assumptions, you know, you, that the uh, the medium is uniform because obviously if, say if this was in water, if the water got shallower the wavelength would change. Um, we're also assuming that the wave fronts are in line and this becomes important with light, that's why we use laser light because laser light, um, all the waves are in the same, uh, they're all in line with each other basically. Okay. Uh, and also for this idea to work, the distance to the screen has to be large compared to the slit size. So that um, that just makes the calculations a lot easier. And also, we did see that when you're looking at diffraction, early on, the pattern doesn't quite emerge. You have to move a bit further out for the pattern to become repeatable and clear. Anyway, so we can imagine that a wave front moving from here and a wave front moving from here, if, the, if it's a, a long distance, because this little section here is forming a triangle, this wave would have travelled a little bit further than this wave, which means that you have an opportunity for those waves to either constructively or destructively interfere. <coughs> now this is where the assumptions come in. If we assume that it's a long way from the gap size, uh, if we assume that it's a long way away uh, to the wall where the wave is going to be shown or, or, or screen, then you can pretty much assume that these lines are parallel. If these lines are parallel, then this angle will be equal to this angle here. Um, now, it's totally arbitrary. We didn't have to choose a distance of half of the gap size, which we're going to be calling B. But um, if you, you know, it's a, a simple enough place to choose, and it means that you've got numbers that are easy to work with. So anyway, this distance would be half B. This is a right angle triangle. If this is half the wavelength then the waves are going to be exactly out of phase and you're going to get cancelling out. So you can find the first minimum um, in the diffraction pattern, uh, what angle it will occur anyway from the central line, um, just by doing a little bit of trigonometry. So this is the hypotenuse, this is the opposite. We're using the hypotenuse and the opposite, so we're using uh, sine, sine theta opposite of hypotenuse, or lambda over 2 over b over 2, which simplifies down to sine theta is usually equal to lambda over b. This is where you'll find destructive interference. And it shouldn't be really too much of a surprise that um, constructive interference would be 2b because we're just basically saying that this is now just lambda one wave out. When you're, in t when you're out by exactly one wave, the waves will start adding up with each other again and you'll get constructive interference. Okay, so these two formulas can be used to do all these calculations uh, uh, for simple diffraction. Okay, so this has implications for speaker design. This is a subwoofer. It's used for uh, bass, 
the bassy noises you get in uh, like drum beats and stuff <coughs> and it's got a large aperture and that large aperture means you get it's closer to the wavelength of the actual sound and you get more diffraction tweeters on the other hand the waves are very small higher pitched sounds and because the waves are small you need a small aperture to create the most diffraction so that everybody in the room can hear the sound okay so again you can see it's quite common design that you get the size of the speaker can tell you what kind of frequency range is going to be coming out of it because that's how they're designed okay so if you pause the video and read this example question and um, have an attempt at it as well okay so I'm going to go through this question uh, so we've, we've got sp a speaker here it's playing some music some drum and bass which is very bassy um, with a frequency range of 100 to 3000 Hertz it says to take the average and calculate whether each ear is going to have the same kind of experience basically I've got a couple of key numbers the distance is two meters they're a meter apart the ears are the speakers uh, aperture size is 50 centimeters or half a meter okay the speed of sound here has been given to us as well on that day and the speed will change depending on the day and the, the temperature of the air and pressure and such um, so what we aim to do then is to work out where the first minimum will appear because of the diffraction and see if uh, it's anywhere near this ear okay so step one let's get all the information collated speed of sound uh, frequency well it said to take the average so we had a thousand Hertz and three thousand Hertz add them together divide by two two thousand Hertz uh, the gap size was 0.5 cm, 0.5 meters um, I'm basically using this equation I'm actually missing the wavelength but obviously I can use the speed of sound and the frequency so V is equal to F lambda rearrange for uh, lambda is going to give me V over F 340 over 2000 0.7 meters sorry 0.17 meters is the wavelength of that um, wave on average okay so <coughs> if you had a perfectly designed speaker for that m that music it would have a diameter of exactly 0.17 meters that wasn't the case the diameter was 0.5 meters so what we shall do now is look at where the first minimum will occur okay so we've got sine uh, we're going to be using this equation and substituting numbers into it lambda over um, over the gap size or the the uh, uh, the um, size of the aperture and just this number divided by this number gets us to 0.34 taking the inverse sine of both sides gets us 19.9 degrees so just to go back to the diagram if you measured an angle of 19.9 degrees and drew a straight line that's exactly where you'd be hearing uh, less sound it would be much quieter alright so let's just get back to where we were so now we need to do a diagram and work out whether the outside ear can hear as well as the central one okay so if this is two meters and this is one meter so the first the central ear was here and the outside ear was here what angle will this be so again we just use um, this time we're going to be using the opposite and the adjacent and the adjacent that's tan so tan theta is equal to a half inverse of um, take the inverse of tan of both sides and we get 26.5 degrees so basically we're going to be pretty close to a minimum if you're um, if you're here okay the minimum would be occurring a bit a bit down here so really in the answer to the question it wouldn't be having as good a time as the central ear the person listening over here would be hearing um, degraded sound it wouldn't be as loud okay so thank you very much for watching I hope you've enjoyed this and remember to subscribe like and share